All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom event. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I'll be your host for today. I want to do a huge hello and welcome to everybody on behalf of National Geographic Education. We're so happy to see everybody joining us live today. National Geographic believes in the power of exploration and wonder. For today, uh, want to do. There we go. There's some feedback, but we got that stopped. Uh, so anyways, National Geographic believes in the power of exploration and wonder to change the world. The heart of our National Geographic community is our explorers, who are cutting edge scientists and researchers, transformative educators, and powerful storytellers. Explorer Classroom's live video events connect students with National Geographic explorers for short lessons and extended Q&As. In a commitment to supporting educators, students, and families during this transition, we are now providing Explorer Classroom every weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So if you like, you can join us again right back here tomorrow. All right. Well, today we're very lucky to be connecting with Alize Carrere. Alize is an environmental anthropologist, a National Geographic Explorer, a filmmaker, and a PhD student researching and documenting uh, human adaptations to environmental change. Early in her career with the support of National Geographic, she conducted research in Madagascar, where she spent several months uncovering an unlikely agricultural adaptation in response to severe deforestation. Her work evolved into a greater story of creativity creativity and resourcefulness amongst the oft repeated narrative of climate doom. Alize is currently pursuing a PhD at the University of Miami in ecosystem science and policy. And just before we jump to meet Alize, uh, I want to acknowledge that we are joined on screen by several students from home, which is pretty darn cool, and way more joining us live via YouTube. So there's so many groups that are representing across North America and around the world. I won't be able to get to everybody, but a few quick shout outs now. Uh, just from looking at the YouTube chat, I can see we've got groups joining across North America. Uh, looks like pretty close to all 50 states, ranging from Hawaii to Wyoming to California to New York to New Jersey, North Carolina, Maine, uh, Missouri, Illinois, uh, Montana, Idaho. So we have a great group joining. Looking, we've got groups in Canada joining us, in Ontario, Alberta, British Columbia, even Manitoba. So lots of great groups joining us live today. So don't forget to introduce yourself in that chat sidebar. Send us in some questions when the time comes. But that is more than enough from me. It's now to turn thing, time to turn things over to Alize for today's Explorer Classroom. Hi, Alize. Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for tuning in from around the world. I know we've got people, um, some several people who I know, but also people that I don't know. So thank you for tuning in. I'm super excited to talk to you today about, um, about a few different things around exploration, South Georgia, wildlife. Um, and I, I look forward to opening up the conversation as well and hearing from you guys about that too. Um, so let me share my screen and um, let's kick this off. All right, so um, Joe, are we good? Everything look good? Good to go. Great, okay. Um, so thank you so much, Joe, for that introduction. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a National Geographic Explorer, I'm currently a filmmaker as well, starting um, working on some short films and um, a feature length documentary. And I'm also a PhD student at the University of Miami. So I am beaming in from Miami, Florida right now. It is very hot and humid, um, but that is not going to be uh, the, the environment in which my talk takes place today. Uh, will be much colder, icier, and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing that, that journey in uh, a much colder place for what you're seeing on the screen here. So um, before I get into uh, some of my topics, I just want to give you guys a background about who I am and where I'm from. I am from um, upstate New York. I'm from a place called Ithaca. Some of you might be tuning in from that general region. Um, and I want to just quickly show you guys the house that I grew up in. This is a, a home that my parents sort of renovated and built. Uh, and if you look uh, carefully, you can see that there's a 300 year old oak tree growing through the front porch of our home. And this home, it's not technically a tree house, but it certainly felt like that as a kid. Uh, it was a really special place to be raised and it really brought the natural world into my environment. And I think in no small part contributed to what it is that I do today as a National Geographic Explorer. Um, this was a, oh, this is a, a little drawing that we found recently of um, some tree houses that I drew. I, I, we don't actually know the age. We were, I'm putting age six, but parents, if that seems generous, I, I have not looked at children's drawings in a long time. We don't really know, but I want to show this just to illustrate the, the whimsical nature of our upbringing and how it was a huge part of, of my, my childhood and certainly entered into different parts of my life uh, as, a, as a kid and even as an adult. So, um, but I got my my title of a National Geographic Explorer uh, in 2013 when I applied for a grant to do research in Madagascar. 
this was part of the National Geographic Early Career Grant Program. And I went uh, not to study lemurs, which is what you're seeing on the screen there on my shoulders. Those are black and white roughed lemurs in Madagascar at a sanctuary. Um, they wouldn't normally be that close to humans, um, but these were being reintroduced into the, to the natural environment after being a part of the exotic animal trade. Um, but I didn't go to actually study lemurs. I went to study trees or the lack thereof. And my research was uh, spent looking at these really interesting formations that you're seeing on the screen here called lavaca, which are deep erosional gullies that form across the highlands of Madagascar as a result of deforestation. So when you take away all the trees, the soil has a hard time you know, being held together. And so then when you get weathering events that releases huge volumes of soil from the hillsides. And my research question for this, this um, project was to understand how farmers were adapting their practices to live um, and cope on a day-to-day -day level with these erosional uh, gullies. So I traveled um, for several months on dirt bikes with my local field assistant, uh, which you're seeing up there in the top left corner to understand what was taking place on a landscape level um, with these types of, of accelerated environmental changes. That has actually been the basis of my work for the last several years. I look at how people around the world, communities, um, people, I'm an anthropologist, so I focus on people, um, how they've adapted to environmental change. So in places like Bangladesh with sea level rise and Vanuatu with coral reef degradation, uh, in the United States, which is my, my most recent story that I'm working on right now around the invasive Asian river carp, with some, which some of you might know of, um, and in Ladakh in the Himalayas uh, in India, looking at glacial melt. So together these stories, I'm working on compiling compiling them together um, to tell a story about human innovation and resilience in the face of change and what that looks like. So that's been really exciting and I, and I love my research, but that's actually not what I'm here to talk to you about today. What I'm here to talk to you about today is something really exciting that I have been waiting years for. And this is uh, the official release of um, an educational series called Modern Explorer that um, we created in partnership with National Geographic Education and Lindblad Expeditions. And this, um, I'm gonna walk you through this story and some of the, the content that's featured in this series, but you guys are going to be among the first to hear about it. Um, it's live now on the National Geographic Education uh, YouTube channel and in the chat box, we'll certainly provide the links for that. Um, I would encourage you maybe afterward to check it out if you're interested in some of the stuff you hear today. But I wanna, the, the idea behind Modern Explorer, it's, an, it's a free online um, educational series. It's nine episodes. And the goal is to look at what does exploration even mean today? What, is that, what does it mean to be an explorer? It can be a really loaded term for many people and, and it has a, a lot of weight to it. But what does it mean today when we feel like our world is charted and mapped and we don't have all the places in the world to explore the way we did perhaps 100 years ago? And the idea for the show is to look at how some of the early explorers explored. And then bridging that with somebody who's the gentleman there with the hat named Tom Ritchie, who I'm going to talk to you guys about in a minute, um, all the way through to my generation as a current National Geographic explorer and how different trends and patterns and, um, and practices have changed over the years. So I hope that it's, it's a, I'll, I'll give you some more information about the series at the end, but um, let me just go into a little bit more about what it is. And you guys are going to get some teasers and clips throughout this presentation so you can uh, get a taste for what it's about. Our first uh, season, these nine episodes, um, primarily take place in South Georgia and the Falkland Islands. Um, so if you're not familiar with South Georgia, you're, you will be at the end of this presentation. Um, South Georgia is an island uh, in the Southern Ocean and it is full of incredible wildlife uh, that has really come back from the brink of near extinction in many instances because of the whaling industries um, throughout the 19th century and early 20th century that were um, present in this area. These are king penguins behind me, uh, which I'm also going to talk a little bit more about. There's a whole episode, in fact, there's two episodes on just king penguins alone in the series. And the reason I'm, we focused on South Georgia is because um, this region, Antarctica at large, is a place where a lot of explorers have gone to try and traverse landscapes and peaks and understand it, a really um, foreign ecosystem. My co host for the show is a gentleman named Tom Ritchie. And Tom is I don't know how else to say it other than just a legend in the ex world of exploration, um, certainly within the national, or sorry, certainly within the Lindblad community. Um, we, Tom, Tom has been exploring Antarctica since the 70s when um, Lindblad Expeditions was one of the first companies to bring citizen travelers down to Antarctica. And so he's been going 
two to four times a year since the 70s. So we have deduced that Tom is probably the single person that has been, that has been to Antarctica more times than any other person on the planet. Now we don't know that for sure, but if you think about it, if he's been that many times um, since the 70s, that's a pretty impressive, uh, impressive number. So Tom, um, I'm just gonna give you a little background on him. He's, like I said, he's been exploring since the 70s. He is an absolute living encyclopedia. He has so much information about anything in the world you could imagine. And he's a wonderful co-host for me because I don't, I mean, I'm not a wildlife biologist. I went down there to learn from Tom about these stories of explorers, the wildlife that's taking place um, or the wildlife that exists there and what's happened over, um, over a century of, of really turning things around in terms of human activity. So with that, I wanna just quickly share with you the, um, one of the trailers, the intros to the series uh, so that you can get a little taste for it. We're getting an up close look at some of the cutest animals on the planet and some of the smelliest. I'm Alize Carrer, an environmental anthropologist and National Geographic explorer. This is my friend, Tom Ritchie, a naturalist who spent decades in the field. Together, we'll discover what it means to be a modern explorer. All right, so you will see that at the beginning of every episode um, because the idea is that these episodes can be watched individually um, or as back-to-back, -back, you know, as a series. Uh, so you'll get familiar with that little tune. I already saw somebody dancing. <laughs> I dance every time I hear it. Um, but the person I want to talk to you about today in this episode is somebody uh, really an absolute legend in the world of exploration. And his name was Sir Ernest Shackleton. I don't know if many of you have heard of him, um, but his travels and adventures and explorations are um, just extraordinary. And I'm going to walk you through one of them, which took place on South Georgia Island. And it wasn't necessarily the success story that uh, most people would love to come back with, but it was an extraordinary success story for other reasons. It was a failure, but an amazing success at the end of the day. So let's quickly talk about that because we have the last episode of our series is focused on this voyage and Tom and I retrace portions of that, um, of that trek. So this is Ernest Shackleton. He was an explorer um, born in 1874 in Ireland and uh, died in 1922 on the island of South Georgia, um, which I'll show at the very end. And he led numerous British expeditions throughout Antarctica, um, attempting to really understand the landscape and make different um, crossings. And the one I wanna focus on today is on the Endurance. And so this was a ship that um, he had the intention of taking down to the Weddell Sea. And once there, taking his crew to trek across Antarctica via the South Pole and end up on the other side where another ship was going to be meeting them. Um, and that was going to be the first uh, crossing of Antarctica. So it was called the Imperial Transarctic Expedition. And I'm gonna just show you uh, what's happening here on this map with my cursor. So the ship took off, as I mentioned, um, from the island of South Georgia, which is where most of our series takes place. We were also on the Falkland Islands for a bit as well. Um, but uh, Shackleton took off with his crew and this um, red line shows where they, where they sailed down to the Weddell Sea here. And the idea was that they were gonna get off here, they were gonna make the trek through the South Pole. Meanwhile, this orange line that you're seeing was the Aurora, which was another ship that was gonna be coming on the other side of Antarctica and setting up different um, supply depots so that they could make this trek across the continent. Um, but if anybody knows about this, this journey, um, which certainly maybe some parents on the, on the cam or teachers know, um, this went terribly wrong. And what happened was um, really, uh, I'm gonna focus on this portion because this, is, this was the intended journey, but really this is what happened, this little circle, this colorful circle that you're seeing. Just to orient a little bit, that's um, South Georgia Island. You can see it off the tip of um, South America here. And then this is the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. So it's a really like a, just a little sliver in the ocean there. And that was where Shackleton took off from with his, um, with his vessel. So off they go in 1914 to set sail for Antarctica. And what happened um, with this failure, I'm, I'm gonna let this video explain it and then I'm gonna come back and talk about it. So this is a short little clip. Um, just because I want you to see what they were up against and what took place on this, on this voyage. Shackleton and his 27-man crew set off from South Georgia to Antarctica. But before they got to the continent, their boat, the Endurance, was trapped in an ice pack. After nine months of struggling to get free, they still failed. 
the ice pack shifted and their boat sank. That really should have been the end of it. Their expedition was over and they were sure to die. But that's not where the story ends. So let's put another 30 seconds on the clock. The crew made camp on the ice and drifted on the flow for six months. Eventually, they were able to make a break for land using three dinky lifeboats. They were starved, frostbitten, and exhausted. Yet somehow, they all made landfall here on Elephant Island. But Tom and I aren't on Elephant Island. We're on South Georgia, which is where the crew of the Endurance needed to get if they were going to be rescued. So let's put another 30 seconds on the clock to wrap up this story. It'll be the last time I cheat and add time. See, back in 1916, there were whaling stations on South Georgia that could mount a rescue to Elephant Island. If only they knew there were men stranded there who needed saving. So Shackleton handpicked five men to join him on an 800 mile journey. They set sail on the open ocean using the most intact lifeboat they had. It was a straight shot. And if they missed it, there was no second chance. Miraculously, they stayed on course and Shackleton and his crew marooned themselves here on the southern coast of South Georgia. But they found themselves on the wrong side of the island. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you a quick map here of what that, that little, um, clip just showed. So essentially, as I said, they, they took off from South Georgia right here. This, the Endurance sailed down here on this red line, down into the Weddell Sea, and then the pack ice got so strong and thick that it basically trapped their ship. So they got stuck in the middle of this pack ice and had to just move with the ice flow. And that's what you're seeing on this yellow line where the ship was just drifting stuck in ice. And the men got off the ship and basically set up camp on the ice while they were slowly moving along that yellow trajectory. So can you imagine for nine months, they were sitting on the ice on a camp with their ship trapped in ice next to them as the ship continued to move. I mean, just think about that for a second, the time. So then the ice, the ice got so strong that it basically crushed the ship and the ship sank. But the men were still there you know, on the ice and it started to break up and they made their break on three little sailboats to Elephant Island. So that's what you're seeing on this green line here. So they get on those three, sail those three little lifeboats, get to um, Elephant Island, but there's nobody on Elephant Island. It's a completely deserted place. So then Shackleton being the leader that he is said, okay, well, the next closest place is South Georgia, which is where I need to get um, in contact with people at the whaling station, because that was the only contact they could, they could um, make in this area. So Shackleton takes off with just four of his other men, so five total, on a small lifeboat and travels for 16 days through the rough open sea with a sextant. I mean, they didn't have GPS, they had nothing. They had a sextant in order to get there, which is an old instrument for guiding yourself at sea. And they made it, I mean, it was like, the fact that they made it was so extraordinary. I mean, it was like finding a needle in a haystack. So they made it after, I mean, they were in, in reindeer hides, sleeping, just incredible gale force winds, very little food, little water in a little teeny lifeboat bouncing around through the ocean, trying to find uh, an island. And so the fact that they made it is absolutely extraordinary. But when they got to um, the island, as I mentioned, look where the whaling station is. It's on the other side. And he didn't want to sail over there because if he tried to go around the island, there was the risk that he could be, they could have been blown off course and then not made it. So they decided it was, it was better to, well, and circumstances were such that they landed on the southern coast um, of, the, of South Georgia and then decided it was going to, they were going to have to cross the island uh, to get to the whaling station. So this was the crossing. And this was not an easy crossing. First of all, it had never been done before. This was the very first time that anybody had made an attempted crossing. And this is a group of, um, of five men who've just come off of nine months on the ice, you know, several weeks making their way towards this island. And then having after that to then go try and uh, do a, a 36 hour trek, completely exhausted with no provisions, making their way all the way over to the Stromness Bay um, whaling station. And this is what it looks like. I mean, this is insane, you guys. This is a crazy landscape. South Georgia has these rugged peaks and it was the middle of winter. So it was covered in snow and ice and glaciers. This was a really harrowing expedition with three men, or excuse me, five men who showed up on the shores of South Georgia, completely destitute with like just haggard. 
trying to then have to make a 36 hour crossing that people do today with incredible gear. So again, it was another part of the story that just makes it so unbelievable that they were actually able to do this. Um, and I will say two of his men were not strong enough to actually make this crossing. So it was just Ernest Shackleton and, and um, two of his other men. So only three of them in 36 hours crossed the island. Um, they didn't sleep. They, they didn't have any gear. They just took off and went and they were gonna come back and get their other men. And the idea was that once they were able to reach the whaling station, they could get together people to then come back and rescue his men that were way over on Elephant Island. So I wanna just open it up quickly. What do you guys think you would need today? What would we use for an expedition and gear to cross an island like this? All right, I'm gonna watch the chat sidebar. So anybody who's tuning in, send us some suggestions for gear that they would need, but I'm gonna now go to a couple of our live classrooms and see what they think uh, about what we could use. So Ellie in North Carolina, what kind of gear do you think one would use? Um, probably because there are like such big peaks and mountains, probably something to climb the mountains, like mountain gear, like ropes, um, something to like, <laughs> like something to hold them while they climb on the ropes. Like that's exactly. crazy. Like exactly. All right, so let's pick another group here. Let's go to New Jersey with Nicholas and Nodiko. Let me turn theirs on. What do you guys think? Uh, I think they might use feel for the mountains and stuff and like maybe some pick pickaxes like to mine stuff for the feel. That's right. That's totally right. Good. All right, Bruce family in Mississippi, your microphone is on. Oops, there it is. Um, lots of layers, jackets and good shoes. Great, no, those are all wonderful, um, wonderful comments. I don't know if Joe, if there's any others in the chat bar that are coming through you wanna just shout out. Yeah, let's see here. Uh, someone said an airplane. We've got lots of phone clothes. <laughs> an airplane would have been nice, but that was the, that's what's so crazy about this, you guys, is that they didn't have any way of letting anyone know where they were. People knew that they had taken off on this voyage and then just 14 months went by and no one heard from them. So they all thought they were dead. Yeah, a few more here. Water, food, warm clothing, uh, a snowboard for going down, GPS, some kind of vehicle, medical supplies, helicopters, cell phones, right. lots of modern stuff. You guys hit it all. That's exactly right. You know, like polar gear, crampons, right? For your shoes, first aid kit, ice picks, tents for, for sleeping, for, um, you know, ropes, of course, like protective gear for your eyes. That is what most explorers today would use for a type of crossing like this. Well, what's, what makes this even more crazy, as I said, was that, that they didn't have any of that. This is what they had. They had a carpenter ax that they were using as like a pick, an ice pick, they had screws from the lifeboat that they were putting in the bottom of their shoes as crampons. They had one like big piece thing of rope and an oil lamp, okay? I mean, I just, to me, I get chills thinking about it because it's so crazy to me that they were able to do this. Um, and remember just with immunity and at, like unbelievable, I mean, they just must have been surviving on adrenaline. Um, so that was their experience. Now, I um, was extremely fortunate to be able to go to South Georgia Island in a ve under very different circumstances aboard the National Geographic Explorer, which is a wonderful vessel. Um, Lindblad Expeditions is the travel company um, that, that travels down here. And we had a very cushy expedition and got to um, travel and retrace a portion of the area on South Georgia where Shackleton and his men crossed as they descended down on the whaling station. So this image is Tom and I, we're, we're walking across the interior portion of South Georgia. The landscape would have looked very different for Shackleton because it was covered in ice and snow. Um, and, and I mean, it almost looks enjoyable here from what we were doing, but we were very winded. It's, it's not an easy journey at, at, without having all of the terrible weather conditions that they had. Um, and we trekked across uh, just the la very, very much the last portion. I mean, it took us only just a couple of hours to do this. Um, and we ended right where Ernest Shackleton would have seen and looked down at the Stromness Bay Whaling Station. So that's Tom and I standing at the top of the pick. That is Stromness Whaling Station down below, which is there today. It's a ruin. Um, and I just imagine Shackleton and his men making this, this visual. This is the first time that they have come across other humans in basically a year and a half. And they hear the bell, the 7 a.m. whistle calling people to work at, this, at the whaling station. 
And that's when he realizes he's made it. And so they descend into the valley and make their way to Stromness Whaling Station to get the help that they need. And, and remind, remember, everybody at the whaling station knew that Shackleton had made this trip. They thought he was dead. So to see this haggard man with a black, you know, blackened face and falling apart clothes showing up, people didn't even recognize him. So it's almost like an eerie ghost-like scenario when you, when, you when you think about what that must have been like, that introduction after so many months of being isolated and alone. And then meanwhile, remember Shackleton is there, but his men are still on Elephant Island and they waited for four months. Their, their leader took off. He took an 800 mile journey to a little island, could have definitely died on the way to that island and they would have had no way of knowing that. So they every day had to keep morale high. They were trying to play games and cook and every day they looked out for their, they called Shackleton the boss. He was called Sir Ernest Shackleton the boss. And they every day would get up, they would dress themselves and be ready for their boss to come back and greet them on the shore with the rescue boat. And just think about that mentally, like what that would involve to, to really have to um, show up and not lose, not lose faith that, you're, that your leader is going to come back and rescue you because he could, they, for all they knew, he was, he was dead. So they were um, living on, you know, trying to make do with what they had. Um, I just want to ask, does anybody know what this, um, what this thing is in between these two men? All right, let's see. I'll check the chat as well. Let's start with Ellie in North Carolina. Um, is that a stove? It is a stove. Do you know what they were using in that stove to keep it fired up? <sighs> Coal, something, um, wood. Like, what did they have there? It's a good question, right? Because there's no trees on these islands. Does anybody else have an answer? Let's try the Bruce family. What do you think, Mississippi? Maybe they're burning up their tents or used clothes and waste. That would make sense, but uh, there's something else I'm looking for. Let's Think about quick... the whaling industries. Like, what were the whaling industries there for? Let's take a quick look online and see if anybody has figured it out. Uh, oh, lots of whale blubber. Whale blubber. Blubber. Whale blubber. There it is. It's a blubber cooker. So this is why, I mean, the, the whaling massacres of the 19th century were taking place is because the, the blubber was being stripped from the whales and then boiled down and turned into a waxy oil, which is whale oil. And then that was, in these instances, it was fueling. And then if you look carefully, do you see that chunk of ice on the top of the cooker? That's how they would melt, uh, melt ice to make uh, drinking water. So that's just to show you, I mean, this is how, these were the, the conditions under which they were, under which they were living on the ice. But things got really destined. I mean, look at this. Like, it was not an easy place to be for four months. You'd already been nine months on the sea. This, like, it's just the story goes on and on. You just really can't imagine what it must have been like to be one of these men. So the, the amazing part of the story, which I'm sure you're sort of starting to figure out, is that there was a rescue. And this is, it's such an extraordinary story that I'm going to show a little video that, um, that's sort of the behind the scenes of the story that's a part of, it's not, this isn't in the series, but this is a little bit of a behind the scenes that captures what that looked like, that rescue. On Elephant Island, the crew of the Endurance had been keeping lookout every day, hopeful for Shackleton's return. But days turned to weeks. After four months of waiting, just as all hope was lost, a lookout spotted a ship on the horizon. The men built a smoke signal to draw its attention. And on August 30th, 1916, Shackleton returned in a tugboat to rescue his crew. The expedition was finally over. They never made it to Antarctica, but because of Shackleton's leadership, every man survived. So when we talk about exploration, I mean, that's a story that for me is just so powerful and, and, and Shackleton's journey and this, this um, expedition has been looked at for leadership skills, the way he was able to keep morale up with his team for so long and what he had to do. And he was so stoic about it. He didn't overshare details because he didn't want people getting worried. It was, it's really, an, it's, it's astonishing what he was able to pull off and that all 27 men came back alive after such a harrowing expedition. Um, so there's that, that final picture. Um, I just wanna to touch on the whaling stations because this is a huge part of, like I said, part of exploration in the 19th century and, and certainly um, natural resource use. And in, in the episode, if you guys watch episode eight, which is called South Georgia's Dark History, we explore this a little bit as we visit and walk around the ruins of Stromness Whaling Station. It was one of the peak, I mean, they, they were one of the most prolific whaling stations in, in the 19th century. 
Um, those, those ships were basically killing machines for whales, elephant seals, penguins to get that blubber. And they would be put in these huge vats and boiled down to create whale oil. Um, and this was, this really defined a lot of the activity, human activity in this area for a period of time. And they almost hunted these animals to extinction. I mean, it, I don't know the exact number, but it's something like in the, in the two or 300 like elephant seals left in whale. I mean, it's, it's just astonishing what they, what they did and the, de the destruction they caused. Um, and I, I want to just show you, this is a clip from that episode to show you what uh, you can see the, in this image here, what the whaling station looks like today. Obviously everything's in ruins. Those are um, bones on the, on the shoreline. Um, but this just shows you what these, what these instruments looked like. Ships like these were lethal to the whales of the South Atlantic. It can run down the fastest whales, blue whales, fin whales. And then with that gun on the back. Oh my God, yeah. Yeah, it's a cannon. And that would throw a spear. Yeah, that would shoot a harpoon and the head of the harpoon, the harpoon point, would penetrate the body of the whale and it had a grenade in it and it would blow up and kill the whale fairly quickly by exploding inside its body. Yeah, so I, I, I know that's a gruesome segment, but I, I think it's important that we remember that this was how we conducted ourselves in this area um, and, and what it did, the devastation it caused to the wild animal populations of South Georgia. Now the story has a positive ending and that is that um, South Georgia and the wildlife in this region has rebounded unbelievably since, um, since then, since all the whaling stations have closed. Um, that being the whales are still slowly coming back, not quite the same success story as the penguins and the seals. Um, but the, the, because obviously their life cycles are longer, it takes while, a longer time for them to, um, to get back up to their, to their numbers. Um, but this area is an, an incredible place for, it's like a playground for seals now, fur seals and elephant seals and king penguins. It's just like full of it. And it, what's so amazing to me is to watch these animals come back in this area that was just a killing station for, for them, you know, less than, you know, hundred years ago. So that was a really uh, amazing part of the story. And we explore that in the episode eight. I encourage you to watch. It's a really funny ending. Tom and I go kayaking and see the like little seal pups running in like in the play area where their parents go off to feed in the ocean and come back. So um, check it out. And this was a, a, a shot from the taken looking into the ocean. You can see the ship there in the background, um, but that up front is an elephant seal, which I also really hope that you guys uh, look into on the episode because um, they are really crazy looking and cool animals. Uh, they get a bad rep, I think, for being ugly and smelly. And I certainly experienced the smelly part, uh, which you'll see as well in the episode, but this is episode seven called Seal of Approval. Uh, where we look at um, elephant seals and the way they, they have harems, they, they dominate the shore, um, but they coexist with king penguins and fur seals and so on. So it's, a, it's amazing to see the density um, with which these animals have taken over this landscape. Um, and last but not least, I know this is one of everybody's favorite creatures in this part of the world, the king penguins. It was certainly uh, one of mine. And I wanna show you this uh, segment from an episode just to show the loss of fear. They don't, they're not afraid of humans anymore because they've been completely left alone for, for a century. And so they don't have that concern about being around humans. And there was nothing more incredible for me than being able to watch these animals, especially because they're on two feet. You know, we kind of tend to experience something, some sort of a connection with them when they look at you and they kind of turn their head. And I was just amazed to see how, how their populations have rebounded and being able to walk amongst the king penguin colonies on the shores of South Georgia to this day was one of the most uh, incredible things I've ever seen. Gosh, we really do have some followers. There's quite a following here, yes. Mom, they followed me home. Can I keep them? <laughs> look at, look at, look at, look at. It's amazing. I think they have a natural tendency to want to be in a group. We've got groupies, Tom. Yeah. We've got groupies. <laughs> King penguins instinctively huddle together for protection against the cold. It's why these colonies are just enormous. So, um, like I said, we have two episodes dedicated to king penguins because they're so much fun. Um, this is episode six, The Future of King Penguins, where we look at um, what's happening with their um, population and the numbers as it relates to climate change, but also um, just coming back from from where where they were, you know, a hundred years ago. So 
uh, it's really amazing to to interact with them. I mean, of course, we don't touch them. They and that's per regulations. You're they they have to you know you keep your distance, and if they kind of come toward you, that's okay. But um, but they are are really a fun creature. I and they just look so so good too. Um, so last but not least, we had a chance to also visit Ernest uh, Henry Shackleton's grave. And this is on South Georgia. He died in 1922 of a heart attack on the island, um, attempting his fourth uh, Antarctic expedition. And um, he's buried here. You're well, people are welcome to go see it. Um, and Tom and I at his grave really had a deep conversation about what does it mean to explore today? And how is that changing in terms of the tools and the technology and um, the ethics around it, right? Like we, we don't collect artifacts anymore, or we shouldn't, right? We document them, we digitally organize and categorize so that those, those artifacts stay with the communities and the people um, where they belong. Like that, that, was, that was a different time when those types of collections would happen. Um, but also from exploitation to conservation. So South Georgia is an incredible conservation story. And look at what happens when nature is given a chance to rebound. And I, I know that some of us, even in the light of the current moment, are seeing and experiencing some of that. And it's really exciting because it happens fast. If you give that time and that um, ability to, um, for nature to come back, it, 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 it will. Um, so I really, I, I think in the chat box, they'll be posting um, the series. These are the episodes, uh, nine episodes. They're around four to seven minutes each. So they're not very long. Um, they're meant to be sort of digital classroom resources. Uh, they each touch on different topics. Some of them are very much focused on animals like albatross. There's an episode um, on the Commerson's dolphins. There's an episode on obviously the king penguins, the history. Um, and, and all along the way, like I said, we want to understand how exploration has changed for the better and what it means uh, to be an explorer today. And certainly there are so many of us at National Geographic, we are all doing such different things from doing microbial research to trekking out and, and traversing unknown areas, or in my case, studying societies and people and how we live uh, with the world around us. So yep, four to seven minutes for the episodes. They can be watched individually. We design them so that they can just you know, be examined uh, as an individual piece if you wanna watch something fun, or you can watch them back to back. The total runtime for all of them together is about an hour. So I hope you enjoy. Um, I, we had so much fun putting this together. Lindblad and National Geographic Education did a phenomenal job of making this come to life. And I really hope it's a valuable tool um, and gives you all hope for the types of explorations that you want to do uh, in your lifetime and that it's all possible. You know, it's, it's the times are changing and there's different ways of looking at um, deepening our knowledge in different areas. It doesn't have to just be the first person to cross a continent. So I want to sign off, well, say thank you. And then I, instead of doing a ton of questions, which I'm welcome, I'm more than happy to do. And I would love to further this conversation. If you have comments, you're, I'm going to put my email address up at the end. But what I really want to know is from some of you guys and between the classrooms on the Zoom cam and those on the chat, I want to know what does exploration today mean to you as young people entering the world? What is it? What types of feelings does it evoke? What types of people should be doing it? What types of tools are they using? Like, what does exploration today mean to you? What does it mean to be an explorer in your mind? So I'll open that up and let's have a little chat about it. All right, Alize, sounds good. Thank you for an awesome presentation. I mean, looking at the accomplishments of Shackleton, he was a legendary explorer. So it's so great uh, that you're sharing some of his story. And uh, especially with our generation who's joining us today, a younger generation who may never have heard of these explorations from, from the past. So that's really cool. A couple of things to get to really quickly before we open up the discussion is just a reminder that uh, we'll post the link, but if you go to the National Geographic Education YouTube page, you can find a playlist with all of the Modern Explorer yeah. episodes. So you can check them out there, but we'll post that link uh, as well. Okay, so I'm gonna keep an eye on the chat. Let's see uh, what kind of thoughts are coming in from the people uh, joining us online about exploration today and what it means to you. But we've got some students right here in front of us. So let's start off with them. I'm going to start with the Bruce family in Mississippi this time. What does exploration mean to the two of you? Um, being out there and, and experiencing it for yourself and just being around nature and being surrounded by it. And Great. Being yeah. What does your brother think? Um, I agree with her and like kind of getting away from civilization and just being around the nature. Absolutely. I think we all could agree that that's something we, we look, we yearn for right now, especially. 
All right, I'm gonna turn another microphone on here. We have someone joining us with a wonderful flower crown. How are you doing today? That's you. Hi. Hi. Lucy. What's your name? Lucy. And Lucy, where are you joining us from? Uh, Seattle, West Seattle. All right, very cool, Lucy. Lucy, what does exploration mean to you? Um, it means to learn about things that you really haven't learned about yet. <laughs> Lucy, I love that. That is so true. And the reason I think you just totally nailed it is that there's always more to learn, even in the areas where we think we know things. And that's so much of science and scientific research taking place right now is deepening our knowledge in areas that might not look like the conventional exploration of the past, but that really expands on what we already know and, and helps get into the corners that we didn't know. So you're so right. I love that. All right, we've got brothers in New Jersey. Let me turn their mic back on. What do you think? Uh, I think exploration means to travel in or um, on an, an unfamiliar area. Great, Hello. absolutely. What about your brother? Does he have a thought? He left, he doesn't. <laughs> what can I do? All right, good answer. Let's go to North Carolina. Ellie, what do you think? Um, I think it's about learning more different places or even our own communities, like to help the environment or to help the people who live in it and maybe to just uncover the truth about history sometimes. Oh yeah, that was a perfect answer. Absolutely, you're so right. And that's, and revisiting some of our history, right? Because we don't know, like when we go back and look at, well, that wasn't a good practice. That wasn't ethical. That wasn't the right way to conduct um, ourselves in a given environment. And that's, that's important. And redefining what that means, like what exploration means. All right, to add a few more from the chat. We've yeah. Got, it means, uh, Katharina says, it means to be in nature, have camps, find new things, help climate change. Anita says to learn and have fun while doing it. John says, exploration means discovering things without damaging the ecosystem or the world. That's nice. Good. Uh, let's see. And then we've got another one. Exploration means learn new things, preferably about a subject mostly unknown to society. But I think it could be just unknown to you. And that's still exploration too. Yeah, absolutely. No, those are such good answers. And I think that I, I really encourage you guys when you, if, if you get a chance to watch the series, to think about all of those things while you're watching, you know, these episodes and how people, you know, what they, how they viewed natural resources, how they viewed wildlife um, and, and what it meant to travel and also the types of people. I mean, I, look, it's, you see in all those pictures, those are white, mostly white men who were able to travel and had good resources. That is changing today, right? I'm a woman, I'm, I'm a young scientist. There's other people around the world who are doing incredible research who don't look like the Shackletons of their day. And that's, I think that's absolutely for the better. And I hope that all of you guys see yourselves in, in this story and in the stories of other explorers today, many of whom are represented across National Geographic, um, females and, and just people from all walks of life and coming from all different backgrounds. Uh, and I, I think it's really important that we make exploration a much more inclusive term for that reason as well. Um, so I, I know we're kind of nearing our, our, our time here. Joe, are there any other types of questions coming in or, or comments that people want to share about, about the series, about, uh, you know, and I'll do my best to answer. I'm not a wildlife biologist, so, um, I, you know, I'll, if there's questions about animals specifically, I will email Tom and Tom can get back to you, um, but feel free to be in touch with me by, just so you guys have it. Um, here is my uh, my Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. I'm I'm on there at alizacareer.com and you're more than welcome to email me if you have any follow-up questions as well. All right, absolutely. Well, let's squeeze in a couple questions. So let's sure. take one from YouTube to start. Uh, and this person's wondering about climate change. Uh, how does climate change in the US compare to what you've seen in other mm -hmm. countries? You visit lots that of countries. How does the US compare? Great question. Um, so, uh, whew, um, it depends where we're talking about in the United States, because there are certainly areas like, look, I'm in Miami, Florida, and we are seeing the effects of climate change and sea level rise and king tides and heat and all those things regularly. But for the most part, um, 
America is a privileged country and that we don't have to experience all of those impacts on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis the way, for example, places at the poles do. The Arctic is warming 2.5 times faster than anywhere else in the world. And that's what's really hard, I think, for a lot of people when we talk about climate change is to understand the, the intensity of this taking place elsewhere in the world. It's not evenly distributed. So places like South Georgia, places like Antarctica, places like the Arctic are experiencing it at a much faster and more intense rate. And so that's why places, you know, here in the United States, yes, we do feel it here and there, but it's not forefront of our minds the way communities living in, in some of those other areas are. All right. Great answer. So I'm going to jump back and we'll steal a question or two from our on-camera groups before yeah. we wrap up today. But I do want to give a shout out quickly. Uh, if you do stick around till 3 p.m. Eastern, so about 15 minutes from now, we're going to go live uh, to the Columbia Ice Field in Alberta using a satellite unit to connect with Allison Cristelio. And she is going to drill ice core samples for us live uh, on a glacier. So that's gonna be pretty wild to so stick around. Totally for tune in for that. That's awesome. Yeah, it should be pretty cool. All right. So Lucy, 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 let me turn your microphone back on. Lucy, do you have a question? Um, not really. <laughs> it's okay, Lucy. Did you enjoy the presentation? Yeah. Excellent. Did you learn a lot? Yeah. Lucy, which was your favorite animal that you saw on the screen today? Um, I like the king penguins. <laughs> They're pretty fun. I hope you watch the, the king penguin episodes because you're going to get to see them in all their glory. Okay. Good choice. All right. Uh, Ellie. Um, I'm not sure at the moment I have any questions, but I just wanted to say congratulations on your show and I look forward to watching it. Oh, thank you, Ellie. That's so sweet of you. I hope you enjoy it. And if you have any questions, please reach out. I love hearing from people and that's across the board here. Anybody listening in the YouTube chat, like please touch base. I, I try and engage a lot with my um, with the people that are listening and following my work. So lo would love to hear from you. All right, uh, Alize, why don't you stop the screen share? So before sure. we wrap up, we can have you back on screen with us. Absolutely. Uh, okay, let's check Nicholas in New Jersey. What do you think, Nicholas? You got a question? Yeah, um, were you able to touch the king penguins? No, I didn't touch them. Um, we got close, but we don't, per the regulations there, you are not supposed to touch the animals. It's, it's up to them if they want to come close to you. They do, they do come close. They kind of curiously look, look their heads one way or another. Um, but you saw how close they came in, the, in the, some of those images, didn't you, or the, the film. Like they're, they, they, they're not afraid of humans. And it's really wild when you see another creature standing on their two front, te two front feet looking at you. I mean, you feel there's something very human about it and not to anthropomorphize them, but like it, there is something you connect with in a way that um, was really special when I got to interact with them. They're loud too. I hope in episode, um, in episode, the first episode of the King Penguins, I don't know if you guys know the sound penguins make, but they sound like kazoos. They're like, zzz, zzz, zzz. <laughs> you have to watch the episode. It's so crazy. Most people don't know that, but they're such funky, fun animals. And it's amazing when you see those colonies with their babies, when they're coming back from foraging at sea, how in the world they find their baby when they're all making that sound is just unreal. And they do, because they all, they know, they know. And it's just thousands and thousands of them. All right, and let's one more visit. Bruce family in Mississippi, take us home. Was there a specific person or explorer who inspired you to do this? Oh, that is such a great question. Oof. Uh, I don't have anybody specifically that's coming to mind right now, but I will say, um, I had two very intrepid parents and my father was a sailor for most of his life, or for, excuse me, for in his first portion of his life, he used to race um, catamarans and sailboats all around the world, as did my mom. And um, I think their stories and their adventures and that spirit of wanderlust was a very big part of me as well growing up. And um, I, 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 I guess I'll, I'll end by giving it, giving that credit to my parents on some level. I'm sure they'll appreciate that. All right. Well, first of all, I want to say that you can check out Explore Classroom and many, many more educational resources at nachioed.org. 
Uh, like I said, we have tons of events coming up every day at 2 p.m. Eastern. We sprinkle in some cool events from the field at other times as well. Like if you stick around for another couple of minutes, we'll be live on the Columbia ice field. I just got a WhatsApp message from Allison. The satellite unit is connected. So we're going live there shortly. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so a huge Great. thank you to everybody on YouTube. We had a huge group today. Thank you for your comments. Thank, thank you, you so much, much, everyone. And Alize, thank you. It looks like an amazing series. I posted the link in the chat. If you head to the National Geographic Education YouTube page, you'll find the playlist of Modern Explorer there. What a blast. I'm going to turn the microphone on in a second uh, to let our students joining us say goodbye. But again, uh, Alize, thank you for an awesome lesson. Thank you guys so much. All right, so go ahead. Thank uh, you, thank thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. So yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks for Bye. Off. Bye. I'll see some of you in a couple minutes. <laughs> <laughs>